So when it comes to most forms of activism outside of pride, I believe that um, as society there's a need to mainstream and advocate for certain issues because we now have in our evolution and development as people, we've grown from, if you look at our, our, our population numbers, in the past hundred years, our population has astronomically grown to where we're now 7 point something billion people and we're also moving more and more into a global identity where we're having a homogenized ideas so it means that identities which somehow were secluded and were, no, were not so prominent and not so visible become more and more visible especially in our cosmopolitan areas so activism for me is important in that in that sense is that it creates awareness it creates the understanding of that as people diversity is the true magic and is the true beauty of it but when we go specifically into pride and pride month I don't really believe in those endeavors because it comes with its own politics as to how it has a history of exclusion and even currently if you go onto the social media spaces there's a lot of conflict that they're having with the current pride organizers and a lot of contentious statements and attacks that have been going on so what I believe pride is meant to represent and what it represents currently for people in this country are looking at all races and being all inclusive i don't think for me as an african person pride is something that, pride month is something that necessarily actually brings any sort of meaning to me apart from it being a space within which you can freely express your sexual identity mm, um and and before even become um getting into the spiritual aspect of it um can we talk about just the 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 a sexuality in African history and how um, and how the LGBT community has you know kind of not just been treated but had to find and navigate their way in an African society when we say African society we need to question as to what do we say is African society mm. do we look at um, Africa from or let's say a colonial view when the colonizers came, do you look at Africa from a missionary point of view before colonialization came? Because the missionaries came before colonialization came and religiosity came with all of its strictures and everything where a lot of people were converted into a system which was foreign from them. Or do you look at it from Africa pre-colonialism when we still were Aboriginal people that lived in an indigenous way and had an indigenous understanding of environment, of community and of self. Mm. That, that for me, I think whenever I look at anything that has to do with the African question, I like to take it back from a point where we were freely African in Africa. Mm. And to penetrate any sort of knowledge for me, what is always central is looking into what in our language because language is culture encoded Wangari Matai said this is one of my favorite quotes is that if you look at our language in most of our African languages there is no word for he and she so the uh, the separation of gender is something that has been a modification and a modernization in our language that comes with all of our with all of the history and the evolution and time and what has gone on in africa but even now you find that a lot of people who are more into the vernacular and speak the vernacular and haven't necessarily gone to to western schools when they speak they struggle with when to use he and she they will call a he a she and a she a him because it's something that's naturally not within our language group and then when we look at sexuality, I always like to take things to the root of things. Sexuality stems from the root word sex. So sex is just a physiological thing. I am born as a male sex. You are born as a female sex. When we look at the act then of copulating, it is called sex, sexual intercourse. So now when we go back also into our language, African language doesn't actually have pure words that that revert, refer to sex we it was never something that we openly discussed it was something that was very intimate i mean when you're ha when you're having sexual intercourse 
but it can see for less at you go with your so in jail I actually peace I even when it's something that is spoken about because the whole idea of in modernity in a Eurocentric modern postmodern world view things like your sexuality and what you identify with are encouraged to be openly spoken about mm. but in our African indigenous people you find both in the language that gender was not something that was an important thing that's hence we have the lack of the he and she and issues such as sex and sexuality were not something for public discussion it was something that was always intimate between the two partners so when we look at it with the lgbti community we can always say that if that was something that was sacred not secret that there was always a space within which it existed and it never needed for itself to actually have to explain itself and when i speak of the fact that in our african indigenous way of living when we were still an aboriginal people because sex and sexuality was such a purely intimate thing that didn't belong to public discourse and was not really something that anybody had a a a, an, a right to feel as though they were entitled to have an opinion over somebody else's sexual space because we all understood the sacredness of what is mine in toyami and what is others you understand and hence how we are brought in the system of ubuntu of umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu and the principality of ubuntu speaks of the fact that every single person who is born here when you look at it from a spiritual point of view how they are born spiwo sabo it is the gift within which they were born in which is why when we look at what in modern times is called mental illness in our african ngebunvu people who are mentally well were seen as gifts because it's pure sabo law to be different there's a certain purpose they carried and then carrying back into then now starting to introduce the spirituality even of when we look at to sexual identities and the lgbti community we always struggle to find words which describe the fact that because there's a, there's a school of thought that says that homosexuality is an African and it was introduced but with colonialism and all of that but in the Ngoma space I always like to teach from something that I can say that I'm a knowledge custodian of meaning is Ngoma to a seed and singing which means that I train other people and in training other people your knowledge needs to go beyond where it's self serving and it's serving to those of your clients only but also you take a role of being a teacher you take a role of being an historian you take a role of taking a simple thing such as a song and understanding what encounter encoded knowledge is within that there's a certain song yemzawe that you that that is sung and the song goes E baba ndingwenze handina mkatsi ndingwenze e baba ndingwenze mina ndingwenze handina mkatsi ndingwenze and that song says that ngingwenze angina mfati ngingwenze baba ngingwenze and when we then go and look as to what in in guni ngeswati ngesimvu ingwenze is that was typically a man who lived until an old an elderly age angakaze waba nemfati angakaze waba nemntwana those kind of people are described as tingwenze and typically it would also be a word of clon peace i would say this is a person who carries a different identity from what is mainstream because what is mainstream heteronormativity is not something that is a western or a patriarchal construct that is the way even if you look at nature heteronormativity is just how most of nature is designed but it doesn't mean that it's the only design within which nature is there because we do need for what is the uh, the male sex and the female sex to reproduce so that life can continue and there can be a continuum whether it's in nature in plants in animals that is a necessity of it but when we go back and we look at 
words like say Ninguenza, it identifies that there are other identities that exist within the space to the point that even in the sacred songs that we sing as Bangoma, we speak of and we sing of identities like that. And the interesting point is that with it being a Nzawe song, anybody who knows Guti Mzawe Yin, Mzawe is associated with living here. And what would be your sacral chakra, your root chakra area. And Mzawe is charged with what? With a large aspect of Mzawe is actually sex and your sexual life and your fertility and your reproduction. And the fact that Mzawe openly re- embodies and represents and sings and honors such identities shows that even LGBTI communities in the highest echelon that we have in our practice of spirituality were were identities that are embraced when you're born also you can be male and have a female lozi yes you know male and a female have a male lozi and that affects not just your sexuality at times but also just your relationships with people and the more you embrace it it can then you kind of embody you know the energy of Lizozi and, and, and then it can you know affect um, you know the way that you interact with other people and how you feel about about people as well um, can you please talk touch on on that as well because it's, it's something that you know now is, is, is becoming kind of mainstream knowledge in the space so was that joke let's come down from the high esoteric cloud and take it just from a physical level and take it lozi from a physical level what is Ilozi on a physical level it is your dna the fact that you can inherit certain traits from an ancestor that lived six generations ago the fact that you can inherit certain pathologies within you that either make you susceptible to heart conditions and whatever from your genealogy which is your dna the fact that you uh, you can inherit certain looks where you could be born into a family of very light-skinned people and then when we have Vumbuga and your dog it means that our ancestors live within us in our blood and when we go back into looking as to what you're saying about the masculine feminine energies we can look at it first from the fact that if I carry most of my DNA has reincarnated or has emulated perhaps my great-grandfather who was Ingwenza and is my great-great-grandfather because he in in African culture if your great-grandfather had seven brothers each and every one of them is your grandfather Mm -hmm. because those people share the very same DNA and you also share that DNA so you could find that in a patrilineal sense in a nuclear sense you don't find connection and say how can I inherit maybe my great-grandfather's fourth-born brother who was Ingwenze but those kinds of things happen because is not their direct ancestor in terms of a linear bloodline but is their ancestor because they come from the same family so when we look at Ilozi and how Ilozi could affect you just on a purely, purely bio, biological sense what if when you, you've just inherited the DNA coding and then you're born and you have these traits where you find yourself not attracted to women because your grandfather was not attracted to women and that doesn't necessarily then mean that you are a homosexual person what it means is that you are not attracted to women and that is not something upon which you act and when you look at the lgbti Rainbow, you find people that say that they're asexual. So that could be an example of inheriting a blood ancestor who then makes you in a certain way belong to the asexual community in the LGBTI. Mm. When we go further into perhaps then the spiritual aspect of it and we look at the divine feminine and the divine masculine, mm. I am male, but most of the energies I carry, I carry bokok. Mm-hmm. And the importance of that is that when we look at our Bantu cosmology and we look at the mythology and the folklore and we look at stories of creation, we'll borrow from one that's very popular, U Uma and the Tree of Life, which is narrated in Kredomuta's book, 
Ma is the feminine and the tree of life is the masculine and all life was created by when Uma had a longing I, I figured I would see and she was alone and she wanted a partner and then Umvelin and Tumela then the masculine tree of life and then they began this dance because Uma Beang Amfuni and then they eventually when they came together they gave they, they, they gave creation to the first humans. So in in our divinity, in our highest echelon where it's not an ancestral level but actually our pantheons of gods and goddesses, there's always this duality of masculine and feminine being on an equal balancer and that reveals to us because folklore and mythology what it reveals is the principalities within which we subscribe to and that's how we as a people now found ourselves realizing that there's an importance for there to be a balance between the masculine and the feminine so you will be born perhaps male and you will carry a feminine energy so that it can balance that out in science i mean it's spoken hurry the males have xy chromosomes you understand mm-hmm. and women even though are xx there is actually a certain level of y chromosome you have so we all carry both those masculine and feminine energies and it always needs to complement each other because sometimes when you put things that are too alike it doesn't work out if i am already male it means within me i have the general tendencies of the masculine energy which is to be assertive to be dominant to be easily prone to aggression and then i inherit mainly a masculine energy that will create something somebody who is hyper masculine Mm -hmm. and we see a whole lot of that in the current society where we're in because even though in the truth of the matter we can speak about this narrative as to how you carry a feminine i carry a feminine energy you carry a masculine energy and it goes like that's what what you inherit but it is about acknowledgement and when you find now in the space most people recognize with the masculine energy they recognize with abom cool most healers you meet most of them tell you what you mean in even men themselves because we find ourselves in a patriarchal society that has created the superiority of the masculine energy so even a lot of males embody and call upon and acknowledge the masculine energy and if and i will recognize a little that is little Mm. Yesterday you touched on the importance of of looking at Isin food before um, placing heavy e- e- emphasis on Ubuvoma because you know of the the root yes. like, that the root of it is Isin food. Can you please touch on that again so that people also it's something that people can um, understand more So I've in in my indigenous knowledge consultancy i've i like to put together equations and little things in order to be able to teach the knowledge so when we ask Gutsi in Isin, it's indigenous knowledge systems and any system is a science so a science has many disciplines because science equals knowledge all it means is that the body of knowledge that a certain kind of group has has accumulated over a period of time and are then able to use in order to ensure their survival because knowledge and science is based on intellect and intellect is charged with our human survival here so when we look at the importance of sindhu and how and the equation that i speak of sindhu is essentially imvelo which is nature invela pia which is where do you come from your ancestry and then when you when all of that comes together what does it unlock who you are the truth and the essence of who you are so when we look at the importance of what is isinvu if we don't have a natural understanding of the world within which we li- live as healers and understand the fact that our forefathers and ancestors learned firstly from nature because whether it's from an African perspective, whether it's from a secular perspective, all innovation that we have which has led to our human in- in development comes from biomimicry, which means that we study from nature and everything is an invention that biomimics something that exists in the natural world. Mm-hmm. Much like the sun rises in the east and will always set in the west, um, the, the world rotates, revolves around the sun. The moon come, comes and is full and it controls the, the seismic movements of, 
of the of of the vibrations of the of of the earth and therefore controls how water flows and it creates high tide and low tide those are natural elements within which all of our understanding of knowledge comes from and the, that is a system that doesn't have to do with belief it is something that in the way i'm describing the sun and the moon and the cosmos and everything it reveals that in our and in in our indigenous knowledge our ancestors had a deep inherent understanding of astrology and cosmology and how all of that worked out because if in divinity it can be spoken of huri god, god in the swanet mythology is spoken of as ramasedi the sun god the masculine energy the moon is described as medina lady the mother of the stars and each of them when you go into what they charge with medina lady in the in the tswana mythology she is the goddess of the waters and the oceans and all of the attributes that are described to how she is or what astrologically is 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 qual is is associated with the qualities and properties of what the moon is able to do with urama sedi even the qualities and properties that is narrated in what seems like a folklore tale of creation are the very same properties and elements within which the the sun actually has even in a scientific astrological world view and then you go into how then it interacts with the earth that is the very same principality with in which if you if you study if you study geography how it is described so those are the kind of power full ideas and powerful powerful knowledge systems that things like isintu has mm-hmm. isintu has the understanding that before we now moved into the space where we attribute to the drum with mangom our indigenous people every home always used to have a drum they didn't they didn't have musicians they didn't have radio they didn't have all of these modern things we had so they made music when they say africans sing and dance it is based on that fact that at home you would make your own music you would play all of those instruments and part and parcel of that can be seen as something that's just a social <laughs> a social system to bring together the family in a, in a communal in in a communal activity that brings about joy and, and drums up the feeling of camaraderie but then if we go into the science of sound in latin we are called person which is where the name person comes from and person actually mean, comes from a root word of son which is sound so even the na- the word people person means that we are of sound so our ancestors always inherently knew the importance of always connecting with sound by me- in the morning when we then go and look at to what are the, the the benefits that this constant singing and drumming outside of it revealing that our ancestors always knew that we are people of sound it then goes into the fact that sounds it's been researched a lot of research has been done that they are prim- primary sounds that when you make are able to change your dna structure are able to alter your 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 physical state and are able to actually elevate the way, the connections you have within what is in this dimension or what we would say is in the fourth dimension the spiritual dimension so when you drum and you hit that sound at certain frequencies it is able to tap upon those levels on a physical level because the body has memory a memory which is far more superior actually to the mind because as we spoke about dna that dna to be able to remember what your great great grandfather looked like that is a superior memory that is just within the body mm-hmm. outside of the mind and when that drumming vibrates what it often does is that the sensation is not so much a mind sensation it's a body sensation so it taps into that muscle memory and that body memory within there and that if there's certain feelings within which they are conveying of a song that comes from two generations ago when you guys were were proud of who you are and everything when it vibrates and it resonates it rebuilt it it stirs up that memory within your body memory because your body remembers everything
that is the beauty of the body that is the beauty of the dna of dna is that it carries and carries and carries the memories of where our people have been and through sound you're able to then connect people to that because when we speak about music everybody always tells you that for me music is always a physical experience and then it becomes an out of body thing where i go step outside of my physicality so those are for me the importance of understanding is to say to because we haven't gotten to the point where i'm saying let's do this ceremony you need to snare for what it's just about a acknowledging of the prescience and the brilliance of what we are as an african people and what indigenous knowledge actually presents into understandings on scientific levels on social levels and just on actually how our history and our knowledge is archived even in things such as mythology and folklore and tales of creation that are seen as just oral traditions that are passed on but it's knowledge encoded it's science encoded